OK. So this, this talk is going to be about some joint work with, with Nike Sun, and uh, who was uh, at Harvard when we started working together. Now she's spending the year at Cambridge and will then be uh, at Stanford. Um, and uh, you know, I was slow putting up this title in part because I was debating about what to speak on today. Uh, but I wanted to find a topic that would be sort of in some sense introductory meaning this would, uh, for those who are new to SLE, this would serve as a review and an intuitive un uh, sort of tutorial on the basic uh, ideas behind SLE theory, but also that would uh, have some uh, new results for experts in the audience. And um, uh, so this is what I, I ultimately decided to do. Um, it's based on uh, sort of the idea of this of doing something like this started when I was working with Oded Schramm, uh, proving convergence of the Hausdorff level lines, or the, sorry, the level lines of the um, Gaussian free field to, uh, to SLE4. And this was a, a very long project. It was, you know, 130 pages. It took us uh, years to finish it. But one of, the, uh, one of the important steps of that was showing once you had what I would call driving function convergence, you could then get a stronger form of convergence. And, uh, and the stuff I'll present here was one avenue that ultimately we decided not to pursue. We ended up doing something else. But uh, this was something we somewhat discussed uh, at the time. OK, so first I'll give a, a quick review of SLE. I'll describe what these metrics are. And I'll give some uh, examples and state the main result. So, first SLE. Okay, so this has now been introduced various times at this uh, workshop. But first of all, uh, if I give you the half plane and I have a curve, gamma traveling from zero to infinity, then there's a natural way to encode that curve from zero to infinity. Um, via the Lovner flow. So there's the Lovner evolution, g sub t. So I take the, the normalizing maps, g sub t, that send the half plane minus this curve back to the half plane. So it just goes back to the regular half plane via g sub t. And then uh, this g sub t of z satisfies this ODE when you parameterize by capacity that the time derivative of g sub t of z for any fixed z, so this is the time derivative. This is 2 over g sub t of z minus w sub t. So we have this simple ODE um, where, where, where w sub t is really the image of the tip under the conformal map. And uh, well, this is you know, one of these key things that Oden was able to use so effectively. is that any path gamma, really simple path gamma, corresponds to a curve, w sub t, a one-dimensional function, which describes for every time t where the tip goes if I take the conformal map that looks like the identity near infinity that sends the, and sends the complement of this curve just to the entire half plane. And again, as Stas said, this encodes the behavior of the curve up here in the sense that when wt goes up, this curve veers to the right. When w sub t goes down, this curve up here veers to the left. And sort of the more w sub t winds up and down, the faster this curve uh, at top uh, winds back and forth. And the radial Lovner evolution is defined similarly. But in that case, you have, a, you have a disk, and you fix a point in the center, and I start growing a path towards the center, but I still conformally map back. And in this case, the tip gets mapped to a point on the, on the complex circle. But again, I can just keep track of where this tip goes. And if I know that the tip is e to the i w sub t, if you, this is the complex sphere. 
If I just keep track of where the tip is at all times, I can go backwards and construct this path. Okay, so that, you know, I hope is, is clear to everyone by now that this correspondence between functions w sub t and, uh, and paths in the plane or in the, uh, going from 0 to infinity or in this case paths in the disk going from 1 to 0. Um, now, uh, in general, if I start with a map w sub t and try to go backwards and construct the path, uh, it's not always the case, as Stas mentioned, that the path, that when you go backwards, you get a continuous path. It's possible that w sub t is continuous, and yet when you use this w sub t, and you look at this, you solve this ODE, and you figure out what g sub t is at every time, um, you find that the, um, and then you, you would like to, you find that this, the set of places, <coughs> the filling process, k sub t, the places where g sub t, uh, <coughs> well, I guess, yeah, maybe that's where it's undefined. So <coughs> I'm taking this to be the complement of the usual. <coughs> uh, <coughs> that's right. So generally, k sub t refers to where it's, uh, the points that have already been absorbed, and then what's, what's left is, uh, is a set where you have the conformal map defined. And you can ask, is this case of t generated by a curve? And um, so there are uh, known examples. Uh, Stas gave us one, this, this funny windy thing of um, continuous uh, w sub t that don't give you a, a curve. And I can give you a curve that doesn't arise from a continuous driving function. OK, well, this is, this is not very hard. I mean. Well, the, the curve could not be simple. If I draw something like this, I mean, here's how the, the curve crosses itself. And if you think about it, w sub t has a jump at this point. Right before I cross here, when I do the conformal map, this point would get mapped over here. After I, I cross here, when I do the conformal map, the tip will get mapped somewhere over here. So there's a jump discontinuity in that case. So, you know, you need to insist that the path doesn't cross itself. But also, if I had a path that at some point went back inside and, and was no longer exposed to infinity for a while, and then came back out here and started moving, then in some sense, this entire piece, when it's inside here, can't be seen from infinity. So the, the filling process, which is sort of everything that's been absorbed by time t, um, doesn't change while I'm taking this path inside. So it's not, it's a path that isn't what I call continuously driven. Meaning there's not a single continuous W sub t that uh, determines that path. Okay, now the uh, SLE processes are defined by taking this W sub t to be a, a multiple of Brownian motion. And uh, that corresponds to continu uh, it was shown by Rhoda and Schramm that that does give you a continuous curve with probability one, and they have these properties that uh, have been mentioned many times. Now, you know, when kappa is less than or equal to four, it's a simple curve. Between four and eight, it's a curve that hits itself. Above eight, it's space filling. In this talk, we'll be focusing on these two cases. So kappa less than eight. All right, so now we're going to get to the, the point of this talk which is really to try to understand what it means for a sequence of curves to converge to a curve. Um, and uh, so first of all, I'm going to define a, this metric d star on the half plane to just be, well, I, if I do a conformal map from the half plane to the disk, then I can pull back the metric on the disk to the half plane. So the Euclidean metric. So it's just a, I'm just doing this because I want it to be compact. So it's just a compactification. So this is, this is a metric that um, if I use this metric, then infinity is not really infinitely far away. Um, and now I'll consider curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, going from 0 to infinity in the half plane, modulo time reparameterization. And I'm going to define a distance between them. This is sometimes called the strong distance or the uniform distance. And, uh, and this distance, I'll write it d sub u, 
is the infimum over all um, phi. So phi it just will correspond to a reparameterization of the of the path of um, of the supremum as t goes from zero to one of the distance between f of one in this reparameterized version at t and f two at t. So basically, if I say that two curves are close in this metric, they're epsilon close in that metric, that means I can parametrize the two curves in such a way that at all time, the distance between them is at most epsilon. So in particular, if one curve just went up like this straight, and the other curve went up, down, up, down, up like that several times, even though the image of this curve is close to the image of this curve, they're not close in this sense. Okay, so this is, in some sense, the, you know, if I asked you, if I give you two parametrized curves, what does it mean for them to be close? This is probably the first thing you would come up with. It really says when, you know, the curves are close to each other. Um, okay, but there's another metric that's natural to consider. Now that we have these driving functions, you might ask for a metric that talks about when these w sub t are close to each other. Say in the, if I give you two curves and I look at their corresponding w sub t's and those are close to each other at all times. That's sort of another way of saying that the curves are at least in some sense close. Um, and here's what I will do. Well, generally, I'm going to work in the half plane for convenience in this talk, but it, you could map it to any other domain. And I, I fix a point x, and I draw this curve. Well, there's a conformal map from here to the disk. So let's see. Can you see this at all here? Maybe switch on the light. Let's see. OK. So, um, <coughs> and I can use white chalk. OK. All right. What's that? OK, you can see this, though, yeah. what I've drawn. OK, so, um, right. so, so now I, I conformally map this in such a way that x goes to here, and this curve goes to some curve here. And maybe I map infinity over to here. So if I give you any fixed point x, and I have this curve from 0 to infinity, it, I'll assume x is not on the curve. I can conform, pick this, conformally map back to here. So this goes to the center. And look at the driving function in the radial sense. I'll call that wx sub t. OK, and uh, what I'll do is I'll And then if I had another curve up here, I could define its, uh, its driving function. And so I could have w1 and w2 x sub t. And uh, well, first of all, this, this is not defined for all time because at the time this hits this point over here, viewed from this point, that's only a finite amount of time. So I'm parametrizing by sort of the capacity viewed from this point, which is sometimes called the minus the log of the conformal radius viewed from this point. And um, uh, so it's some, some time this, when this curve hits here and it's some other time when this curve hits here. So these are defined on two intervals that might not be the same. Um, so each one is defined on, I'll define t1 and t2 to be these uh, terminal times. And, um, and so when I say two curves are close, I mean, first of all, that their terminal times are close. So when I define the, the metric, uh, what I mean to say they're close viewed from point x, I mean that you look at their Lovener functions, they are, um, the terminal times are close. And then second of all, when I parametrize, when I look at the curves, they're close for all times. And here what I've done is I've, I've said, well, freeze the, freeze the curve after time t. So this just means that if this is going to be close to this and this runs for slightly longer, I'm not going to allow that in that slightly longer period of time it goes berserk. Uh, so they have to be close for all time and then this can't move very far. Uh, afterwards. So basically, the two w sub t's are close up to the smallest of the ti, 
and then after that TI, I don't go very far before I get to the other TI, and there's not a big motion in the one that's still moving. Okay, so that's, well, in some sense, if I say they're close, in this metric, it sort of means viewed from the point X, they're close. Um, because this driving function uh, sort of tells you at any fixed time t when I can formally map where is, you know, keeping x at the center, where is the tip going? And that would tell you if I did a Brownian motion starting at x somehow. Uh, well, okay, let me, let me get to that point later. Okay. So um, this metric for every point x, this gives me a separable metric on, um, uh, well, equivalence classes of continuously driven paths that don't hit x. Now, it, I should stress that it's possible for two paths to have the same, to be different, but have the same uh, driving function with respect to x. Okay, why is that? Well, the answer is simply that x can be absorbed in finite time. And then after that, you know, this one curve could do one thing and the other one could absor absorb x and do something entirely different. <coughs> Viewed from x, you don't see the difference. You only see up till the time x was absorbed. Okay. Now we, um, it will be natural for us to, to fix a countable dense set phi and to consider all the x's in that countable dense set. And, you know, a nice thing about SLE, capital S and A, is with probability 1, it won't hit any point in that countable dense set. So none of those will be hit by, by the path. So I'll look at paths that don't hit those sets. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, if I wanted to, instead of using a point X, I wanted to use infinity, then, uh, well, the natural metric to use then is to just take dr to be some metric such that the distance between gamma j and gamma goes to zero if and only if the wtj converge uniformly to wt on bounded intervals, on compact sets. And it's not hard to construct a metric like that. Um, okay, so that will be my metric ur. Just to be sure, with w you don't make any um, That's right, w I don't. That's right, that's right. I'm using the, the capacity yeah, yeah. parameterization viewed from, of that corresponding x. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Is it, uh, in uh, this x? Yeah. x I'm taking in the interior. Oh, gosh, why is that written? Um, <laughs> I, I, that, I don't know. That was a mistake. Um, so I'll tell you where these slides came from. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so first is, you know, we were at Microsoft. I asked Nike to give a talk on sort of short notice. And she produced this entire set of slides herself in two hours. Um, after that, before I gave this talk, I spent a few hours sort of touching them up, and I introduced some errors. Um, and so this is presumably one of those. Okay. Um, all right, so... Uh, right, so dr is a metric. Okay, yes. So now, uh, why is this interesting? Well, okay, there's the question of convergence of discrete models to SLE. So, if I gave you one of these um, lovely discrete models, like those Stas was talking about, maybe I have a a loop erased walk or a, a percolation interface or something, and I define this on my, on my grid, some grid domain, I can always then conformally map this picture back to the half plane. And here, in this case, it was discrete paths, but I can just imagine that it's a continuous map. And when I conformally map it to the half plane, I'll get some continuous path from zero to infinity. And if I am taking the mesh finer and finer, so I have a sequence of paths, gamma n. So for every n, I have 
one of these random paths, which represents the, the conformal image of one of these discrete models when I map it to the half plane, then uh, I'd like to say that these gamma n, these random paths, converge to a random path gamma, which is SLE, and SLE kappa. Okay, so how would you actually define that, that these gamma n converge in some sense to the, the probability measures on these paths gamma converge to the probability measure on this path? Well, okay, so what we're going to do is use weak convergence. So we'll consider weak convergence, aka convergence in law, with respect to the uniform metric. Du. So I assume everyone here knows what, what weak convergence means. Um, and, uh, but you always need a metric in order to define it. And I'll use um, this du. OK. Um, the Schwarzschild dudley theorem, so if you don't remember what weak convergence means, this is an equivalent statement for separable spaces. It says that, uh, OK, so this is a separable metric space. The random paths gamma j converge in law to gamma if and only if there is a coupling of the gamma j with gamma in which they converge almost surely with respect to d nu. So that means I can find, I give you this sequence of random paths gamma n. Is it difficult to define the convergence? What's that? Is it difficult to define the convergence? We convergence just says that if I look at a continuous set and I look at uh, a bounded continuous function and I look at the expectations of that function, those converge continuous with respect to this metric. That's the, that's the usual standard definition, but there are, there are several equivalent definitions. It's, okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> All right. So what does it mean coupling? Coupling, coupling it means I can, um, I can define all of these uh, so I, I give you these probability measures on these paths. I can define a one probability measure on an infinite sequence of paths, such that the marginal laws for each path are they're not independent anymore, but the marginal laws are the same as these laws. So it's just sort of defining all these laws on the same measure space, in such the case that with probability one, these paths converge to this. Um, another equivalent thing, which at first glance might look weaker, is that you just say that um, uh, for every epsilon, if you take n large enough, you can ensure that there's a coupling just of gamma epsilon with gamma such that the probability that the distance between them is epsilon is, is at most epsilon, that probability is at least 1 minus epsilon. So really, you know, it means what you'd think it should mean, this weak convergence. It means if, if, gamma, if n is large enough, then I can couple this with this such that with high probability the two paths are close to each other. You know, it's exactly the right notion um, for convergence of paths. You know, any other wouldn't really make sense. Okay, so, um, all right, so now there are some uh, known results uh, along these lines. Uh, first of all, uh, loop erase random walk cap equals two uniform spanning 3 cap equals 8, both of them converge in this sense to, um, uh, to SLE with those values of kappa. This was proved by Lawler, Schramm, and Werner. Um, uh, so a result, uh, so my work with Oded Schramm, we proved that two processes, one called the Harmonic Explorer, and the level lines of the Gaussian free field converge to SLE kappa with kappa equals 4. Um, now, in each of these cases, I want to stress, you know, all the proofs that, that Schramm was involved with, there was a certain pattern that they followed. And that was that, so for all these proofs, first of all, uh, you prove that, the, that you have weak convergence with respect to the driving function metric, that dr that I showed. So you prove weak convergence with respect to this metric. And then after you have weak convergence in that metric, you have a few pages of extra work where you then strengthen that. It's called strengthening the topology. You then show that weak convergence in that metric and some other properties of the, of the discrete model 
uh, will actually imply weak convergence in du. Okay, so that was, that's how all these proofs go. And in some ways, it sort of made sense, uh, the way Oded thought about things, is that, you know, you want to show that something converges to SLE. Well, SLE, you know, it, it essentially has a, it's, its driving function is Brownian motion. So let's show that the driving function of this curve looks like Brownian motion. Um, and then, you know, so that's a, a kind of a natural thing to do. You, you show something looks like Brownian motion, and then uh, after that you try to, to strengthen the result. Um, there was, a, so this percolation result, um, uh, so this was uh, due to, um, so, so Smirnov, um, you know, proved, uh, I never know, you know, ex exactly how, how to state this, you know, but, uh, but, you know, so, so Smirnov, um, you know, proved the conformal invariance of this model and gave, you know, mo most of the details um, for how it, it converges to uh, SLE6. Um, and, uh, and Oded sort of felt that, you know, Smirnov's proof was complete because he immediately saw how using exactly the recipe used here, you could use Smirnov's work and then finish it up and prove uh, SLE6. But somehow nobody wanted to, least of all Stas, to sort of transcribe um, uh, the, the LSW proof over into the percolation setting. And, uh, and so it wasn't until a few years later when Camille and Newman, uh, for other purposes, really kind of wrote down a, a really detailed step-by-step -step argument, which is, um, which is, you know, kind of a long argument. It's also different from what the way Oded would have done it. So he told me that, you know, if it were up to me, I would do it in 20 pages and just do it exactly this, the way these were done. That was his uh, perspective. Um, and then these uh, uh, easing model and FK cluster are, are um, also due to Smirnov, but I think this, this, this last step is, I believe, still in, in preparation or has not been released yet. Um, Okay. So uh, anyway, in all these proofs involving Schramms, I say the first and most difficult step was to show convergence in draw in law in this driving function metric. And this convergence is essentially what you get when you have something I won't discuss here called a Martingale observable, uh, but which you know Stas discussed also. And then you need additional arguments to strengthen it. So the question in this talk is, how far can you get just using uh, Convergence in law with respect to the driving function metrics. So if I just, you know, for these metrics here, I define these drx. Um, uh, and if I just have convergence in metrics like this, or in just the dr. So this was for a fixed point x. This was with respect to infinity. Does that tell me? somehow what I need to know to get convergence uh, in law with respect to this uniform metric. Okay, so I'm going to spend a bunch of this talk showing you what's not true. Um, so there's a whole bunch of counterexamples. Uh, and then I'll show you how we actually, really, you, you can, if you know convergence in law with respect to a generic point, for the path parametrized both in directions, that really implies convergence in law in this strong sense. Okay. So, all right, counterexamples. Convince you these things are subtle. So this is an example first showed to me by Oded. I don't know if he was the first to, to discover it or not. But um, this just shows that forward driving convergence is not sufficient. So convergence in this DR metric is not enough. And what's the example? Um, so what he said is, well, imagine you, you take a, a thin strip, and I'll take a curve that goes up like this, and it keeps coming back and hitting the line. But every time it, it keeps going up higher and higher, and then the points it hits on these lines grow much more slowly. So it's really wobbling back and down a lot. And maybe these points it comes down and hits never get above a certain level. OK. And then. The, the, the sequence of curves I'm going to take is I'm just going to sort of uh, shrink down this picture by multiplying it by epsilon. 
to scale the whole picture by epsilon. And then what happens is, so when I, when I shrunk this far away, I have a path that's very close to the line, but it keeps kind of going back and forth. Right? So it's a curve that's going back and forth. Um, on the other hand, in a certain sense, these paths where it's going down, what it's going, every time it goes down, it goes down into a deep V-shaped valley. And the, and the trip during the, the V-shaped valley is in some sense harmonically invisible from uh, infinity or from a point X outside as well. So why is that? So when I look at one of these curves, um, so just imagine that I drew this curve and then I kind of retrace the boundary very closely for a little piece of time. And there's the question of how much did WT change when I retraced the boundary? Well, what you can see is the amount it changed is exactly the probability that a Brownian motion starting at here will hit that path. Because when I can formally map, this strip you know, becomes some piece of this boundary and the probability um, of hitting that is just the length of the jump in W sub t. So when I trace the boundary, it's really the probability of a Brownian motion starting from here hitting that path that tells you how much of a jump you have. On the other hand, when I, when I do these, these V things here, if I have any point out here, the probability that a Brownian motion comes and goes and hits this sort of retracing part here is very low because it would have to come right here to the tip and go down inside. So the jumps in W sub t during these excursions down into here are tiny. So now the straight line going up is what you get when you just take W sub t equals 0 for all time t. And here, these paths, when I scale by epsilon, you know, I, I shrink them down, I get a sequence of paths which converges to uh, the straight line path in this, this metric dr, and also in drx for any x off of the line. It converges in those senses. On the other hand, in the strong metric, it's very far from converging. Okay, so this is a counterexample that I say, um, uh, Oded and his, his co-authors were very well aware of from the beginning. Uh, well, oh, because there's something else I could do which is parametrized from the reverse direction. So later I'll talk about dr means, well, forward or, or rightward, um, if I viewed this as going from left to right. And then I'll call dl x and dl what I would get if I parametrize the path backwards from the other direction. And um, so these, it turns out that in, for this particular example, the reverse paths don't converge. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So it turns out if the curve is simple and you know forward and backward convergence, that actually is enough to imply a strong convergence. But for this case, it's, it's not. In general, it's not. No, no. This, this keeps going to infinity. This path goes all the way. No, I do mean scaling in both directions. What's that? This little. Yes? The, the distance, this path is, is going wildly back and forth. No matter, for every epsilon, we still go arbitrarily far away and come back to here very many times. No matter what epsilon is, because we're, we, we, we go, you know, we, we come back and visit a neighborhood of zero infinitely often, no matter what epsilon is. I mean, I don't know what, what, what you mean. I mean, I'm, it, it's true up, up, up to a finite time. You, you still have the, you can still have the jumping back and forth. You know, you're, you're going back and forth at, at all. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, you get infinite capacity. I mean, if I stop these all at capacity time one, each one of these random, each one of these paths, then you know the behavior up to time capacity one will get worse and worse in this in this with respect to this strong metric. It will be getting very far away from the straight line, but it will be getting close in the um, uh, in this in these metrics. Okay, so I don't know. Is this clear? Okay, so um, so there are other examples you can do. Uh, when I have, um, if I hit the boundary, so first there are these, you know, there are the silly non. Um, there are examples where where I don't hit. Let's say I converge in the strong sense to a curve that looks like this. So I have simple curves, but they converge in the strong sense to a curve uniformly, to a curve that hits the boundary. Okay, well obviously in, this, in these uh, metrics dx, they're, they're, they're not converging. You know, if x is out here, then you're just not seeing this piece here. So they're converging to something that doesn't include this whole chunk. Um, and you could, you, know, you could do whatever wild things you wanted in here inside. Um, and still have it converge in the strong sense, um, or in the in this dr sense, and uh, and I can actually show you that even if you knew forward and backward convergence from infinity, that wouldn't necessarily be enough because I've got this delightful example. Suppose my path goes like this. So here's zero, here's infinity, and it goes up. It hits here. And then it goes over to here and then comes back underneath, traces almost to here, then goes back over here, and then goes up and hits this point. And what you see is viewed from infinity this side, it looks just like I go up here, then over to here, and then up to here. And viewed from this side, it looks like I go down to here, then I don't see this other part, and I just go right down to here. So in either direction, you only see one crossing from left to right, not three. And yet in the uniform topology, you're doing something different. And you could make this, you know, do arbitrarily many times. So you could make something that's really not converging in the uniform sense, but uh, yet is converging in both the forward and backward sense for this example. And, uh, you know, even if it doesn't hit the boundary, if you have intersections in the interior, you can do something like that. You can, you know, go, well, you know, draw, how should I do this? You can draw a curve like this and do some forward, backward, and then, okay, well, let me just skip that. But, yeah, so, so bidirectional convergence doesn't work once we allow uh, gamma to intersect the boundary, although it's sufficient if gamma is simple. So what we need to do is consider other points x. So, I said before, for any point x, we look at these driving functions w x of t, and I'll write this gamma j goes arrow sub x to gamma, to gamma if I have convergence in this uh, metric d um, x sub r. It will be necessary. Right. You still need to do it both ways. I mean, essentially, you can always do something like that first example I've showed for any path by, by just, you know, going back down inside. Whatever the path shape is, you can kind of always do that if you don't have reverse direction convergence. So you, you, you always need both directions. Okay. So we require bidirectional coordinates. So there's a question. If we have convergence in all DRX, and all DLX metrics, for all X in this Psi, to, some, to something, does that imply we have convergence to something in DU? So I'm not assuming a priori that these limits are compatible. If I have convergence to something, does that imply something in the strong sense? Okay, so what do you think? Who says yes? 
Well, if you've been paying attention, you know I'm still in the uh, counterexample section. So probably the answer is no. What's that? You mentioned already the answer. You said the curve has to be simple. In order for this to work. OK. All right, well, good. You get an A for paying attention. So the answer is no. So this is an example that, uh, that Nike sent me one day. Which, um, so you look at, in this case, what do we do? I go along here and I draw the figure eight. I go outside here, then inside this little bubble here, um, then inside this little bubble here, and then outside here and back. Okay, if you look at this, um, what you'll see is that in the forward direction, it does converge to something for every point. Um, if I'm out here, if I take my x out here, what does it look like? It just looks like I, I do this curve here, and then I, uh, I do this little curve here. I don't see this one, and I do the big one. So if you from outside, I see top thing, little thing here, then big thing here, and then I finished. This one doesn't get seen. And um, what's that? Well, they, they, they get closer and closer to this, um, the, these, these gaps between these points of the loop get closer and closer to it just being the path that traces the whole circles. So why is it that you see the green circles from the um, Because you draw the green circle first before you draw the red one. No, but you draw the yellow one first and then that's higher. Okay, let me. I, I first draw this one, orange one, then green. Then blue, then red. The orange hides the blue. It doesn't hide this one. Look, because I can still, if I do a brownie motion from infinity, I have a chance of hitting this. Because I haven't drawn this yet. Yeah. OK. So, so what you get is, is in the sequence, from every point, I have convergence to something. And yet, you know, I could kind of swap this around inside which order I do this curve up here and which order I do this curve down here. When I do that swap around, swapping around, so I just swap around this figure eight here. And when I do that swapping around, I, I make it so that uh, if I say alternate between this way and this way, then there's no way the sequence can be converging in the strong sense. Nonetheless, for every fixed point, it converges in, the, um, in this sense drx, and same thing in the reverse direction. So it converges to something viewed from every point in both directions. Yet it does, is not Cauchy in this, um, in this strong sense. Okay, so that's sort of annoying. Um, but but these, example, these limits are not really like SLE because they converge to something that couldn't plausibly be continuously generated. So if I look at a point in here, Viewed from inside here, what does it look like? It looks like in the limit. It looks like I, I trace out this whole curve. I cut myself off from infinity, and then I go further inside. And viewed from a point inside here, I see this stuff inside. But I also see that I, I'm still doing it after infinity is cut off. So, so viewed from this point, the limit is a curve that can't possibly be um, a, a curve that's continuously driven with respect to the endpoint. OK, so in some sense, it's clear that this wasn't a, a reasonable limit. No, 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 because, um, see, the important thing is that, um, I mean, remember, the order I do is I, I do first this big one, then I do the two inner ones, and then I do this big one. Okay, so the order in which I do the two inner ones doesn't affect anything. Okay, so these are not like SLE because they re-enter regions that have been cut off from the terminal point. Another way of saying that is that the limiting curves, you know, I look at a fixed x and I look at the limiting curve with respect to this, they can't be reparametrized according to the Lovner ODE. 
because this whole inside chunk takes zero time in the, the capacity framework. So they're not what I will call continuously driven. So to get an answer, we have to require bidirectional convergence with respect to all x in psi to continuously driven curves. So you ask, if for every x in psi, in both directions, you have convergence of the gamma j to a continuously driven curve, does that imply the whole thing has a limit in the strong sense? OK, now who thinks yes? <laughs> OK, Gabor, you were wrong. Um, OK, but this is what I will require. So again, gamma j converges an x to some curve, which I'll call eta sub x, gamma j minus, which means reverse direction, will converge to some curve I'll call psi of x, all continuously driven. I don't assume compatibility a priori. So it turns out from these results, it is possible to prove Hausdorff convergence, so that, the, um, that as sets these paths converge, they have a limit in the Hausdorff metric sense. Um, it's also possible to improve that all of these forward limits and backward limits are compatible. So these curves. It means that one is a, is a subpath of the other. Um, well, I, they're not hitting these, these points in this dense set. So I guess yes. I am assuming that. Yeah, I am assuming non-space filling. Um, and uh, so, so compatible means that, I mean, what's one way a curve could be different? The limit for x and the limit for um, y well, if this path comes in, it cuts off x from y. <laughs> and then it goes on and, and doesn't swallow y till later. But what I say is that the limits have to be the same up until what the first one is cut off from the other. And then do whatever they want to. So, so basically, if I get two different x's and I run these paths until this, this cutoff point for each of them, then one of these, the paths will be a subset of the other, an initial portion of the other. And so by someone's taking the union of all the paths, I get a single path. So it's sort of clear that these limits are exist. But it may not even be obvious that these two things are the same, the forward path and the backward path. Um, so question, is this necessarily the time reversal of this? And the answer is no. So here's another crazy example. <laughs> OK. Um, <clears throat> So this crazy example, what I do is, uh, so I go up to here, and I'm, this is the same as the figure eight example before, except that what I do is I replace the, um, uh, the out inside circles by these fractal trees. So I, I go along and trace the boundary of this fractal tree. And the reason I'm making it a fractal tree is because if I just did a line and traced it back, then I'd be doing something in in capacity time zero, which isn't allowed. I wouldn't have a continuous driving function. But if I trace the boundary of this tree, it's perfectly acceptable. Um, it's continuous with capacity time. And then on the outside, what I do is I draw a whole bunch of little tiny loops coming outside this tree as, as I follow it along. So it's, when I draw the outside, it's also continuously driven with respect to capacity. So I do as before. I do first this outside, then this inside, then this inside, then this outside down here, and go back to the end. And, uh, and what you see sort of as we show, in this case, all of the size you know, kind of live outside of this, this, this creation. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so in, in, indeed it happens that, um, that you get a, a limit in the forward direction that is different from a limit in the backwards direction. And, uh, and again, by, by sort of swapping these two things, you can make sure there's no limit in the strong sense. OK, so things are getting fairly desperate at this point. I've added lots of conditions. And every time uh, I've come up with a counterexample, um, so the limit, uh, I have incompatible forward and reverse limits. You know, let me give you one even sort of crazier counterexample. On um, well, this counterexample, uh, what I'll do is I imagine I, I have a portion of the curve where I just come up and I trace one line 
with a whole bunch of loops below it. And then I come back and I trace the same line. So it's a very, so in this case, it'll be the same limit in the forward and reverse directions. It's just a curve that goes, it traces this, it traces backwards. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some funny business along this path that causes it to not converge in the strong sense. And the funny business is the following. I'm going to, um, as I go along this path, I will draw these sort of loopy J-shaped things where I, um, I go back and I make a hook. And then I come back and retrace the hook and continue. So I have these, these nested hooks. And every hook involves sort of four, you know, I go down, up, down, and back. And the way these, and these hooks are sort of nested in an alternating way so that um, no, no matter whether I go in the forward or the reverse direction, the hook is harmonically invisible um, after I've observed, because it's, it's, when I draw it, because it's nested, in hooks I've drawn before. So either I, I sort of first draw this nested sequence of, of blue hooks, putting them on, and that fills up. And then in that case, every one of these red hooks I draw is sort of concealed by the blue hooks already drawn. Or I first draw the red hooks in sort of the natural order, and then draw the blue hooks. Either way, um, uh, they're harmonically invisible. And limit again is just is squashing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, I would need to add more hooks as I go to make, but, but yeah, it's just the natural thing. Okay. What's that? The little bumps. Oh, that's just to make sure. I told you the limit. I'm going to have these loops on the top and the bottom. That's just because I'm, I'm tracing a line forward and backwards, and I I want it to be continuously driven in both directions. OK, so in this case, the forward and reverse limits are compatible, but uniform convergence still fails. So <laughs> here's the ex counterexample review. If I let gamma be the space, sin be the space of simple curves, I have things converging to 0 in, in this metric for all x, but the gamma not d mu Cauchy, I have, um, well, OK, let's say a, a whole bunch of counterexamples. OK, so, but in all those examples, the problem was that for some t, the past and the future were not separated. I sort of drew this line, and then I kind of retraced the line in the future. So there was a point where if I look at the future, the past, and the path, they intersected at a sort of a line segment. Um, so what I will do is I'll say that a conserve is time separated if for every t, the future and the past have an intersection that is totally disconnected. So I don't have this funny business of an interval. So it's sort of clear if the interval, if this condition fails, I can always do this trick I did here and, um, and make the whole problem fall apart. So it's clear this is necessary. I'm going to argue this is actually sufficient. And this is something that a property that SLE uh, has when kappa is less than 8. OK. So main result, if I tell you that for every x, gamma j converges to some path eta x in the forward direction. And the reverse path, gamma j inverse, converges to some path psi x in the reverse direction with respect to these, uh, these metrics, um, uh, the, the uh, driving function metrics. And they converge to something that is at least continuously driven and time separated. Okay, if I can tell you that for every x, then that implies these things have a limit in the strong sense, which I will call gamma. So I just know some driving function convergence for every point. That implies this, this strong convergence. And uh, so to prove that, it's a little bit tricky. I don't really have time to give you uh, very much of the proof. Um, but uh, and the idea is that this, this strong thing, at first implies you have a, a dense set of non-double times, um, times where the path doesn't hit itself, uh, doesn't visit twice. And, um, and you can sort of prove that you know, I can break the curve into pieces uh, where once I go beyond that piece, I never come back and visit an earlier piece and, um, in, in the limit. 
And then, you know, I know all these pieces are small in size and I'm traversing them in order. So I really know the thing in the strong sense looks like the limiting curve. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, now it's sort of clear how to extend this to random curves. If I knew for every fixed point x that I had a convergence in law, um, then that would imply that, um, well, then, you know, again, there's just some uh, abstract mumbo jumbo. But, you know, the fact that this converges in law for every point implies that, um, you know, basically implies you can, you can show that uh, there's a subsequential limit where they, um, where they all converge together, where for every x is converging. And if, so you can couple them so that they're all converging together. And then if they're all converging together, that implies they're converging in the strong sense, which is equivalent to weak convergence. So sort of I now know that if I just prove, um, OK, so then I get the, right, this is what I just said in, out loud before. So in particular for SLE8, if I prove just for one point, so I only have to treat one point at a time. If I look at these, these curves, gamma n, and I show that for one point x, that the laws of these curves converge weakly in dx, um, if I could just prove that for one point x, and that proof didn't really depend on x, so it would also have worked for any other x, and it didn't really depend on the direction. If I just prove it for one point x, that implies the whole thing converges. Um, so, in particular, if I want to show something converges to SLE6, I have a sequence of curves, what do I need to do? All I need to do is show you that if I take one point in the domain and I start, start drawing this path, that the driving function of that path, viewed from that one point, converges to Brownian motion in this weak topology. That's all I have to show. And that's something that follows immediately from the lawler schramm werner recipe as soon as you have a uh, um, uh, an observable, one of these um, uh, conformal observables. So in some sense, this tells you that the observable is sufficient. You don't need any special properties. You don't need uh, an a priori, you know, tightness result or FKG or crossing bounds or anything like that. All you need is, um, is convergence in the driving function topology viewing the picture from one point. Okay. That's it. Yes. Russ is waiting. Maybe. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll go to the bus and we'll, we'll talk. Sorry, sorry. It's not my fault. It's it's Gaddy's fault. I was. Uh, Are you going to the bus? <laughs> I was under an hour. I don't know what they kept schedule. What's that? The bus schedule waits for one minute. Oh, sorry, Are you sorry.